Well, sometimes you approach sermon preparation and think, what on earth am I going to say? We all know this story of Palm Sunday so well. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where it was proclaimed, Hosanna to the Son of David. What new things can I share with you this year that you don't already know? Well, then I came across this yesterday morning. There was shock yesterday as Buckingham Palace confirmed that King Charles will ride part of the way to his coronation at Westminster Abbey on the 6th of May on a donkey. There was widespread disbelief as detailed plans for the grand procession were released. And in an unprecedented break from convention, part of Charles III's journey will include a favorite donkey from the Highgrove estate. Palace spokesman Zechariah Palmbranch confirmed <laughs> that the Queen Camilla's two-year-old pet donkey, April, was being trained for the big day, despite never having been ridden before. Meanwhile, stunned royal watchers were asking, what kind of king rides on a donkey? Of course, friends, you guessed it. That is an April Fool's joke. I thought it was very, very good. It's not my original. I stole it from Facebook from Ruth Azalea, um, and I just thought it was really funny, and I wanted to share it with you. Because it actually brings into mind that question, what kind of king rides on a donkey? It really made me think, about how strange that first Palm Sunday must have been. It's interesting to think about the triumphal entry to Jerusalem, the arrival of a king, when we are heading towards the coronation of our new king. All the ceremony and all the pageantry that went with Her Late Majesty's death and funeral service, through to the throne room when King Charles III was declared as our new monarch, through to the preparations that are underway for the coronation about 35 days away now. As I watched that declaration of King Charles III, I was taken up in what felt like a very old, ancient tradition. That sort of thing you see on medieval dramas where monarchs are proclaimed, you know, hear ye, hear ye, we have a new king. Obviously in the days before BBC News was on your phone and everybody put everything on Facebook. If we go back to the time of Jesus, then it's likely something similar would have happened when a new monarch was proclaimed. Indeed, in 2 Samuel 5, chapter 3, David is anointed. Charles III will be anointed. There are similarities. And on Palm Sunday, we have this scene occurring where Jesus is approaching Jerusalem in preparation for the Passover. Amidst the backdrop of significant political unrest and under the rule of the Roman Empire, who we know were brutal. Jesus is declared as the king. In some ways, though, the crowd gathering to welcome Jesus in could be seen as a sign of protest and defiance against the authorities. The people wanted to see Jesus and indeed, it's worth noting at this point that the triumphal entry to Jerusalem is mentioned in all four of our Gospels. It's one of those passages that appears, and there is a lot of similarity between those Gospel accounts. Even in John, it's fairly similar to our synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There is significance in laying their cloaks on the ground, which should not be lost on us. Indeed, it's a sign of loyalty. 2 Kings 9.13, for example, the people do the same for Jehu when he's proclaimed king. And it's a sense that people are making a statement about what they think is going on. There are palm branches being waved to mark the celebratory procession. In the memory of Jerusalem, there are stories of this happening before. Indeed, if we dip into the Apocrypha, which is the books that are in some Bibles that are not considered part of canon, we don't, or we don't approve them as scripture in the Anglican church, but they are partly there to help us understand a bit of the, ti the time that was happening. One of the books talks about this. In 2 Maccabees 10, 7, Judas Maccabeus is welcomed into the city with palm branches being waved after conquering the pagan armies that were oppressing Israel about 200 years beforehand. On top of the cloaks and the palm branches, we hear the shouts, Hosanna to the Son of David, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A reminder that Jerusalem is the city of David. A reminder that the Jews have been waiting and praying for a king like David to arrive. And they would have thought, this is the time. Jump into John's gospel. By the time of the entry, we have seen the seven signs in that gospel. Indeed, the last being Lazarus, who we explored last week. And it's clear by this point in the narrative that there is something special about this person called Jesus. So the scene is set, if you like. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Yet, what we often forget is that there is another procession taking place in Jerusalem on this day from the west gate, not the east where Jesus is. There is another triumphal entry. But it isn't about praising and singing about who is arriving. The other procession is about instilling fear discipline and obedience to a brutal regime that had a hold on the world. The other procession is the arrival of a man who will become significant as we journey through these events of Holy Week set before us. At the West Gate, Pontius Pilate is arriving in Jerusalem. He lived 60 miles away in Caesarea by the sea because Jerusalem was too insular and partisan and too hostile to the Romans for him to reside there. However, as the governor, he was tasked with keeping the peace, especially during holy days when emotions often ran high. We even hear of the way he changes his mind on Monday, Thursday, when we remember, as the crowd starts shouting, what do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate says, are you sure? Crucify him, crucify him, the crowd shout louder. And to avoid that unrest, he releases a murderer. He releases Barabbas and puts Jesus to death. He is a significant character in the events that will play out over this next week. He enters Jerusalem on the very same day that Jesus enters, opposite sides of the city. It's the first day of Passover. It's a significant event in Judaism when we remember the freedom that God brought the Israelites from Egypt. It's significant that both these parades take place on the same day. Yet, what we often skip past is that Jesus will have known that this procession that he was in was not what the crowds were expecting or understanding. He is entering, as the prophecy of Zechariah declares, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. And that's Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 12, the prophecy of Zechariah which Jesus is fulfilling. It's also worth noting that Rome did not force their religion on Israel as they did with every other conquered territory because they knew that Judaism was an ancient religion and therefore the Jews were allowed to freely practice unlike other places as long as order was maintained and Roman tribute was paid. And of course, when we look at the history, we know 50 years later, Rome comes down hard on the temple. So this procession, the triumphal entry of Jesus, triumphant for the people because they believe that God's king has returned to rule God's people. Yet we know that within a week, Jesus will be put to death on the cross. The triumphal entry and shout 
of Hosanna to the son of David turn into a sorrowful walk up the Via Dolorosa, carrying a cross, beaten, stripped, and people shouting, crucify him. The triumphal entry changes within five days to the people shouting, crucify him. People turn to God often when there is something they want very badly. But in many ways, that's similar to learning to use a telephone when you need to call an ambulance in an emergency. It's leaving it too late. This is in some ways reflected in church attendance statistics. We see that when things happen in society. Look at the COVID pandemic. In the midst of that, so many more people were praying and saying they were praying. So many more people were coming to church. Yet those numbers have tailed off as we've reopened, as we've got back to a new normal. Where are the people who are engaging? Where are the people who are wanting answers? Where are they finding those answers? Because to me, it doesn't look like it's in the church. But how often do those people who are seeking answers, who don't realize it's in the church, in a moment of crisis, will turn to God and say, help. Help me, Lord. We want Jesus to rise into the city and to become the king that we want him to be. Jesus doesn't wait for our motives to be pure or for our lives to be sorted out before he acts. And thank goodness for that, friends, because if he waited for that, he would never act. He doesn't wait for that because he has come to seek and to rescue the lost. It isn't the healthy that need the doctor, as they say. It's the sick. However, if we cast our minds back to last week, though, when we explored Jesus raising Lazarus from the grave, it will be in his timing and not in our own. We have to wait. He answers in his own way. We know that the people of the time wanted a prophet, but this prophet, Jesus, would tell them that their city was under God's imminent judgment, which we get to in Matthew 24. So he's not necessarily giving them what they want. But what we find as we journey through this coming week, that the people who wanted a Messiah to be rescued from evil and oppression, in their case the Roman Empire, for us insert a blank, whatever it is for you, but what happens is not what they expect. Again, This is another example of God doing far more than we could ever ask or imagine. He answers their prayers about freedom from oppression, freedom from evil, but it's answered at the deepest level. So that means saying no or wait at the conscious level. They wanted it to happen immediately, the conscious level, but actually, through Jesus going through the events of Holy Week, dying and rising to death, God rescues us from evil in its full depths at a very deep level. Not just the Roman Empire and occupation. It wasn't just for those people in that time. It was for eternity. That is what Jesus accomplishes on the cross and through his resurrection. That we too are rescued from evil. We too are rescued from oppression because of what Jesus does. Because he is the Messiah. But more than that, he will be the crucified Messiah whom we worship. When we pray, God acts more thoroughly than we could ask or imagine. He goes deeper than perhaps we are prepared to go. If I can give you an example, I have a tax advisor. His name is Paul and he is worth every single penny. Every year, he helps me submit my tax return, which is a nightmare as clergy, so much so that under HMRC we come under special investigations permanently. There you go. But he often goes much deeper than my tax return. He wants to make sure that I have everything right. That's in many ways what it's like with Jesus. He doesn't just look on the surface, but he goes deeper. He doesn't just bring healing if we ask for healing for a a broken leg, but he brings deeper healing as well. He will bring healing for something that we are carrying and perhaps something else that we don't know that we're carrying. That is the person of Jesus who acts on so many more deeper levels than we can ever begin to understand this side of eternity. 
So, the entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday is another lesson in this mismatch between our expectations of God and how God answers. Matthew 16.23 reminds us of this. When Jesus tells Peter, he has the things of men in his mind, whereas Jesus has the things of God. We have the things of men in our lives, of humans. Of, we have those things that take up our time, that take up our thoughts. We don't have the mind of God. The crowds did not have the mind of God on that triumphal entry. The crowds are going to be disappointed. But their disappointment, whilst it looks cruel at a surface level, deep down will bring about the dawning of salvation when our Messiah goes to the cross, takes our sins, is separated from the Father, cries out, it is finished and then rises to new life on Easter Sunday. So, the hosannas that are shouted by the crowd on Palm Sunday are justified. They're just not for the reasons that the crowd thought, but they're the reasons that we can see looking back at that event. Jesus stands against the powers of the world. We know at this stage in the narrative there are already plots to try and kill him. He was warned by the disciples not to go back to Jerusalem. We heard that last week. But he goes back. But he doesn't just slip in quietly through the back gates in the dark of night. He goes in. After bringing his friend back to life in front of a great crowd, he then enters the city of David on a cult to much adulation on the same day that the governor, Pilate, is also arriving. The disciples will not have been expecting the week to end with Jesus on the cross. Yet there are indications that Jesus already knew this. Those two quiet days we looked at last week before going to Lazarus. Jesus weeps over the city on the Mount of Olives as he knows that that fragile relationship with Rome will ultimately crush the city of David. Yet despite all of that, despite all of that, Jesus still comes. Jesus still stands, and he still sacrifices himself for peace, and for me, and for you. Angels proclaim at his birth, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace and goodwill among people. Jesus' disciples echo the angel's song, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. The multitude that are proclaiming Jesus as king aren't made up of the temple elite. The disciples at the back gate are hailing Jesus as Messiah, calling for peace on heaven and earth, where the the blind and the crippled, the poor and the despised, not the well-known people in high standing in society. They will have been fearing the Romans. But it's the poor and the weak, the blind, the oppressed, that are there proclaiming Hosanna to the King of Kings, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are the people who we have explored in the previous chapters. Since the start of the gospel, when we look at Jesus' ministry on earth, it's the people whom he has engaged with that are welcoming him in as a king. It's those who were healed, loved, and accepted. It's the tax collectors. It's the beggars. It's the lepers. It's the man with the unclean spirit. It's the paralytic. It's Jairus and his daughter. It's the widow and her son. The centurion and his servant. The woman with the issue of blood. The woman with the alabaster jar. And it's all the little children. All the people who are despised and forgotten. They are the ones that are there laying their cloaks down. Waving their palm branches saying, Hosanna to the King of Kings. They are the ones proclaiming the one who comes in peace and for peace. Though it's 2,000 years later, when we look and commemorate what happened, we aren't that far away from Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Nations continue to kill their own people in order to maintain power. Refugees crowd into filthy camps because no one will take them in. Governments allow police brutality, mass incarceration, poisonous water into impoverished communities because the poor cannot fight back 
We are not that far away from what was happening in Jerusalem all those years ago. The banks and corporations have free reign to destroy our environment and gamble with our economy because wealth and power are synonymous. Is it just the way it is? Who will stand for them? Who will stand for us? We feel powerless and helpless. We can feel sad for the poor. We can send money to the sick. We can worry for the homeless and the countryless. But at some point, at some point, we have to stand against that front gate parade without the benefit of literal swords or armor. Because we are called to be disciples, standing for what Jesus stands for. We are called to welcome the stranger. We are called to heal the sick. We are called to make people whole again, even the ones we don't like and even the ones who scare us. That is peace. That's what we are called to do as Jesus' disciples. The only path is through the back gate and onto that cross. But that path through the back gate and onto the cross is the path to resurrection. It's the path to new life. It's the path to being made whole. It's the path to an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. So friends, my prayer for us all this week is that we ponder anew the event that we will hear about and reflect on. I pray that we will discover a new meaning in the wonders of what Jesus achieved for us through the days ahead which we explore together. I pray that we will learn something new about the importance of this season and that we will come closer to Jesus by our own journey from the triumphal entry of today through to the Last Supper, betrayal, death, and into glorious resurrection. Hosanna to the King of Kings. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.